come to our last talk of the symposium. Here we have Dr. Ben Hoff. I leave it to him. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought I should say a couple of things about Ben uh, to get things going here. So Ben took in a sort of an unusual route intellectually uh, in getting here. Uh, you know, if, as an undergraduate, for example, he was an English major, uh, not, and so his career in science was not necessarily anticipated, perhaps in the beginning. Um, so it was only after he worked on diversity issues and 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 um, was trying to train people to take on science that he became in becoming a scientist himself. And he's also unusual in that he's the, you know, in status as a child of Vietnam War refugees. And also uh, as the first generation undergraduate and graduate student in his family. Um, he's also pretty unusual in his personal, <laughs> personal in many ways, but in his personal, excuse me, in his personal commitment to diversity. So this is something that I think really stands out with for Ben. With ben. In fact, we met or uh, in association with the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, otherwise known as SACNES to those of you in the know. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, he then went on at UCLA and uh, worked with Searle uh, and got trained uh, you know, by them and to be a great pedagogue. In fact, he uh, has uh, suggestions to me of him even, even improved my pedagogy, which is a uh, tall order. Um, <laughs> so Ben uh, received the Life Science Excellence Award in Education, in Educational Innovation for a PhD student uh, based on the course he developed and taught um, on the history and uh, uh, <clears throat> on history and racism of biology research. Uh, and so that that's, uh, and uh, he was also the recipient of the SACNEX Award for uh, the best oral presentation uh, for an EEB student in, in 2020. And in 2021, he received the Diversity Service Award from, e, from the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department, and uh, also the Life Science Award, uh, um, that is the Life Science Division Award uh, for promotion of diversity by a PhD student. So it's all pretty impressive in that regard. There's no doubt that Ben is a true champion of diversity and the un underprivileged. Uh, and uh, today, Ben will tell us a little bit about his studies on instructional methods. And he'll also tell us about intriguing research he has conducted on the physical uh, process and habitat uh, relative to the genetics of dispersal in the endangered time order Gobi. And without further ado, let's... Uh, Get Ben up. Oh. All right, this is happening, right? <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Benjamin Ha, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about conservation bio. Um, so, conservation biology has many different functions. Um, we can think of it as preserving biodiversity in marine and terrestrial ecosystems, mitigating the impacts of human activity on those uh, ecosystems, as well as addressing environmental injustices. And there are also many organizations that have helped address these uh, various aspects of conservation, as well as implementing new policies for management. And so we can think about approaching conservation on a multi-directional spectrum, where there are these six factors that I've showed here that contribute to conservation bio, um, but there are also many others that contribute to it, um, such as racism, for example, which is not shown here, uh, but it is directly related. And later, feel free to ask me what my thoughts are on how racism relates to conservation bio. And also feel free to ask how I think uh, racism relates to every individual one of these pillars as well. Um, but I don't have time to share my thoughts on racism today. And so instead, I'm gonna be highlighting most of these elements um, with the exception of culture. So my dissertation um, tackles mostly population genetics, management and education with a little bit of ecology. And for my first chapter, it primarily focuses on how population genetics can inform management. 
So for my first chapter, it's titled Hydrologic Control of Metapopulation Dispersal in the Endangered Northern Tidewater Gobi on the California Coast. And I'll break down what that means as I go. And so my research takes place in coastal lagoons, which are really dynamic systems because of the variation in hydrology that can change the ecology of the habitat. So for example, heavy rainfall or high wave energy can intermittently breach lagoons and exposing it and its inhabitants to the sea. And then whereas drought can lead to desiccation of this habitat and then to keep, keep it closed from the sea, which and then uh, modifies its conditions. And so we even see evidence here in these photos um, for human activity that can further alter the lagoon. And so in general, their lagoons are um, pretty dynamic and are thought to depend on significant to depend significantly on rainfall and the resultant stream flow, which can modify the conditions of the habitat. So the variation hydrology in lagoonal habitats uh, has numerous biological consequences for a range of species that can take advantage of its freshwater resources. For example, you have the steelhead trout, which reproduces in coastal lagoons before maturing and swimming out to the sea. And then you have western pond turtles that nest and forage in freshwater, but can uh, disperse terrestrially to other lagoons. And then similarly, you have California red-legged frogs um, that do the same similar things, but they disperse terrestrially in wet weather. And so tidewater gobies, unlike the others, um, are exclusive to California, and they're restricted to coastal lagoons. And there is no known, uh, they don't, uh, it's not known to have a larval marine life history stage. And so most of the time, it's thought to believe that uh, they spend most of their life in the lagoon itself. So unlike the others, which have different modes of dispersal, tidewater gobies are, seem to be causally linked to lagoonal dynamics. So again, tidewater gobies, they don't have a marine larval life history stage, which suggests that dispersal occurs mostly as adults. And since tidewater gobies are a lagoonal, um, lagoon specialist, uh, it further suggests that its dispersal is dependent on uh, lagoonal hydrology. So this hydrologic driven mode of dispersal allows tidewater gobies to exhibit mud population dynamics, where in theory, one population can be extirpated due to drought. And then a neighboring population can recolonize it um, given that it follows a heavy rainfall event. And so migration then is dependent on rainfall, but the subsequent or the simultaneous breaching of nearby lagoons. Its low dispersal rates can also lead to high genetic subdivision between metapopulations. So if there's no rainfall, there's no dispersal, no gene flow. And um, tidewater gobies is an endangered genus. So US Fish and Wildlife created a recovery plan that designated the management units in white um, and the subdivisions or subunits within those management units in gray. And so while ecological studies have found that there is evidence for dispersal, um, it has yet to be demonstrated genetically. And so understanding then the relation between hydrology and tidewater goby dispersal can help further inform management for the genus. So this leads to my research questions. Are there any genetic evidence for migration? How do migration events affect the genetics of metapopulations? And what are the conservation implications in the Central Coast Unit? So something to note on all of my method slides is actually in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, I provided a timeline as to how it, long it took for me to do any given research project. And I feel like it's deceiving whenever audience sees result slides that you just see one result, but you don't understand that it probably took months, if not years, to just get that one result. So that's why I'm putting that here, to add some reality and break the idea of perfection. So I'm not going to be personally pointing that out every time, but it's uh, there at the bottom for you to read. So this chapter focuses on samples collected in 1990 and 2008 across three subunits in the Central Coast Management Unit. And so we're in the Central Coast. And then this is, is the breakdown for the different subunits. Um, microsatellite markers were used uh, on these samples, and so microsatellites are tandem repeats in um, the DNA, and it's known for its high genetic variation. And monthly rainfall was also collected uh, by a rain gauge in Morro Bay. These are my different uh, analytical approaches, which I'll break down as I go through the results. So I'm going to slow things down a bit um, for family and friends who may be unfamiliar with uh, all of this. So this is a structure plot. And structure is a program um, that uses a clustering approach to infer population structures based on genotypic data. 
in this case, microsatellites. And so on the x-axis, um, you can see our different sites. Each individual column is one individual. And then um, the y-axis is proportion. So it shows the proportion of that genotype belonging to whatever group it had been assigned. And so um, what you're seeing, what I want to focus on is actually these first three sites, which is um, Corral, Laguna, and Tortuga. Um, and these are the first three sites as well in 2008. So in, 19, in 1990, you can see Corral is this red genotype. And then Larguna and Tortuga are these blue genotypes. And then in 2008, Corral becomes this blue genotype. And now kind of looks more similar to Laguna and Tortuga. Um, after, you can also do uh, F statistics. And F statistics basically show you genetic differentiation, differentiation between populations. So if you have a higher FST, that means greater genetic differentiation. If you have a lower FST, that means genetic similarity. And so after calculating for FST values, when you compare Corral at 1990 and 2008, um, they are genetically differentiated. And then when you look at the nearby sites, when you compare Corral in 1990 to Laguna, for example, in 1990, they're also genetically differentiated. And it's not until in 2008 when those adjacent sites become um, similar. And so what I'm taking away from this is that the population or the samples in 1990 that represent the population in Corral um, was very likely extirpated and then recolonized by um, nearby sites, Laguna and Tortuga. And this conceptually makes sense because Laguna and Tortuga are geographically close, closer to um, Corral. So next I looked at monthly uh, rainfall. So on the x-axis is month, y-axis is average rainfall in inches. And these are the two different lines between 1990 and 2008. And you can see that in uh, 1990, there were at most two inches of rain and everything else is uh, below that. Whereas in 2008, you can see in January that it had about seven inches, on average seven inches of rainfall, which was actually preceding the collection date in February for the samples for that year. And so the thing that you don't see here, but um, is also shown in the data, is that between 1990 and 2008, there have actually been select months that had on average seven to 18 inches of rain. And so this, these high rainfall events can be evidence for breaching events in the lagoons. And um, because of the lagoons getting breached, it then suggests that migration could have occurred. And so I wanna be clear though that I'm not saying that this one specific month is the reason why um, lagoons got breached. The whole point is that um, if there is high rainfall, lagoons are more likely to breach. So next, um, uh, as an assignment test was performed, uh, which calculates the likelihood of where an individual originated from based on its genotype. And so in this figure, you can see that arrows um, show directionality, and they also show quantity. And we know where individuals ended up, since this is where they were collected from in the field. Um, and so most individuals were assigned to the same location that they had been collected from. But some individuals were then assigned to a different location that they originated from. And this is what you see in the figure. And you can see that in 2008, there seems to be more movement between sites, whereas in 1990, there is um, Whereas in 1990, uh, there was only two individuals that had been um, projected to have moved. And so we can see that there are two things. One is that there's only migration within these subunits and there's no migration across this geographic break in distance. And then before what I showed you was in the structure plot and the FST values that Laguna or Tortuga likely um, recolonized Corral meaning that migration event across that geographic break in the northern region is probably significant. Um, so there is a difference in sample size, for example. So 2008 had a higher sample size than 1990. So to test if it could have been a function of sample size or where fraction was done. And so, the total number of samples in 2008 had been resampled 1,000 times to equal the number of samples in 1990, since 1990 had fewer samples. And after 1,000 runs, you can see that based on this histogram, that it's expected around 10, seven to 10 individuals would have migrated 
Um, and so what this is telling us is two different things is one, that there doesn't seem to be a bias on based on sample size. And then two, that the two migrants that we actually saw in 1990 in the southern region uh, may actually be significant. And so in summary, for this first chapter, extirpation recolonization um, might have been detected between Corral and the neighboring sites, Laguna and Tortuga. Uh, the effect of recolonization suggests that there's genetic similarity now between these three sites. And then overall, the implication may be to consider removing Corral as a subunit, uh, since it's now genetically similar to the sites in subunit two. Okay, so going back to this um, figure, hopefully I showed you a little bit on how population genetics can help inform management decisions. But before I actually talk about chapter two, I wanna briefly um, address how studies on improving methods is important for um, advancing conservation biology research. And so for this project I did, um, I used a technique called express exome capture sequencing, which allows you to design your own probes so you can capture the protein coding regions of, um, of any other sequences and then use that for ge uh, genetic analysis. And so this approach varies from, <laughs> this approach varies from other research uh, because most research on Tegwork always have focused on microsatellites and mitochondrial DNA. Um, and there's currently no published genome. And so you have to think about different ways uh, to approach research questions for non-model organisms. And so the idea here was that I was going to um, extract mRNA from Inuberii and use it to capture the exomes of 26 samples that covered uh, nine distantly related Gobi taxa. Now, this is a methods-based research question that could have had promising outcomes in expanding interspecies population genetics research for tidewater gobies. But ultimately, the sequences I received in the end were of too low quality, and it was a technical issue with the sequencing core rather than uh, a challenge I had with the uh, method itself. But I spent a lot of my time <laughs> on my PhD and on this project, which is why I wanted to highlight it here. So ultimately, I had to abandon that project as a chapter in January 2023, uh, which led to many identity crises and a frantic call to Dave to try and figure out what I should replace my chapter with. And so this actually led me to returning to a chapter I originally proposed during oral qualifications, which is looking at um, satellite images or includes looking at satellite, remote sensing um, satellite images. And so for that chapter, it actually focuses on population genetics and ecology and how you can use that to inform management. So for this next chapter, um, it is titled an analysis on landscape genetics on the endangered tidewater gobies. And this is still an ongoing project. And so the results I'm showing you today will be preliminary. So for landscape genetics, um, it combines population genetics with landscape ecology by exploring the interaction of how landscape variables affect evolutionary processes like gene flow and genetic drift. And so landscape genetic studies have mostly focused on terrestrial systems and fewer on aquatic systems. And few studies addressed um, specific hypotheses of connectivity such as population dynamics. And so this makes tidewater gobies a, an ideal candidate for expanding studies on landscape genetics. The studies that are most relevant to landscape genetics in tidewater gobies are studies on phylogeography, which is how biogeography relates to phylogenies. And phylogenies is this um, tree that you see on the right, which shows genetic relatedness between individuals or populations. And so this is a figure from Earl et al. that shows how phylogenies have actually informed the management units and the subunits that you saw earlier. And similar findings have also uh, found that linked biogeography with um, morphology in tidewater gobies too. And so this is the extent of landscape genetic studies for tidewater gobies. So there are still many other questions that we can ask, such as how the landscape may actually be affecting population genetics. So my research questions include, how does time relate to population structures? What landscape variables inform population genetics or population genetic metrics such as FST? And what are the conservation implications for eucycle gobies? So as a reminder for chapter one, I only focus within the central coast unit, which was in the middle. And then for this chapter, it actually includes um, over 1,300 individuals um, covering an 18 year time span from 1990 through 2008, uh, and also covers four different management units, which are 
um, all south of the Central Coast unit. Microsatellite markers were still used. And then uh, landscape variables were also collected, which included total geographic distance, the total distance of various rock types, or the total number of rocky headlands, and the average area of kelp. And again, these are my different data analytics, uh, analytical approaches, which I'll break down as I go. Oh, and um, these landscape variables were what were collected through satellite imagery and geological maps. So in order to identify how time may have affected um, may affect the population genetic structures, I analyzed microsatellite data where they had um, overlapping sites. So a site that had been collected in across two different years. So I showed you this before, the colors are just slightly different, but it's the same as before. And this is the structure plots for the Central Coast unit. So again, if you actually flip your mindset and you ignore Corral because of the evidence for um, extirpation, if we look at the other sites, we can see that there seems to be similar genotypic patterns from the 1990 sites compared to the 2008 sites. Um, and there is similar evidence for the South Coast unit, which also had um, samples that were collected across two sites, but that's a much smaller um, sample size. Most of the FST values also confirm this idea that there's genetic similarity between the 1990 and 2008 sites, with one exception, um, which had an FST about 0 0.05, so it's kind of like uh, in the middle. But in general, all the others seem to be fairly low. So another way to look at the effects of time is by analyzing all of the microsatellites altogether across all years uh, for all management units. And so this is what you see here. Um, and it seems to be breaking based on, or clustering based on these uh, management units. And then even though the Central Coast unit and the South Coast unit had samples from two different years, they kind of still merged together within their own um, region. And so what might be interesting is that uh, the distinct genetic breaks between management units might be because of the geographic break in distance between them. Um, the other interesting part is what's happening in the middle with the conception unit, where it seems to be this weird mix, even though it should technically be one management unit. Um, and I want to point out that uh, Site 21, which is Halama Creek, it seems to be having this um, like magenta and blue genotypes, which is sharing uh, it, where it shows that it's sharing genotypes with a site that is south and north of it. I'll, I'll get into that more a little later. So next, I ran a discriminant analysis of principal components, or DAPC. Um, it's similar to PCA in that it's a multivariate um, method to identify clusters in genetically related individuals. Except in a DAPC, you can um, provide a group assessment of k-means, which functions similarly to a k-value in a structure plot. So you can see where, um, when I plotted it, essentially PCA1 against PCA3, you can see that most individuals seem to be assigned to their respective management units, uh, with some exceptions, of course. And then more specifically, um, the Central Coast unit and the South Coast unit seem to be clustering together despite their variation in uh, collection years. And so when we take a closer look at the uh, conception unit, COU, it seems to be clustering in a northern region and a southern region, where Halama Creek is kind of like in the middle of all of that. And Halama Creek seems to be sharing genotypes with the site north of it and a site south of it. And based on this map, you can see that Halamut Creek lies between these two rocky headlands. And then the north, the sites are just north and south of it are just right outside those rocky headlands. So there seems to be some sort of um, communication happening. In the map, you can also see that in general, there seems to be um, several rocky headlands and different regions where it's just mostly sand and rock. And so uh, this allows for um, a dynamic landscape where we can further see how landscape variables are affecting the population genetics. Um, so now I ran a DAPC where I'm only looking at conception unit samples, and I compared it to the structure plots. And you can see that uh, DAPC kind of uh, groups in this certain way, and it doesn't 100% match with what's going on in the structure plot. So you can see, for example, in the blue square that you have these green and yellow genotypes. And then the 
last square is the orange and the red one, they're all blue, but technically they got clustered separately. Um, and so the variation in this uh, genetic break also doesn't really match how the subunits are defined currently in the management unit. And so it may merit some revisiting um, in the conception unit specifically to see how we might be uh, designating these subunits. And again, because of the variation in the breaks in genetic structures, I thought that the variation in landscape variables might help explain why we're seeing these certain genetic breaks in the pattern. Uh, it didn't do much. Um, but what I did was I ran a GLM, which is a model where you can test if different variables, in this case, landscape variables, can predict the pairwise FST values within the conception unit. So my Y variable are pairwise FST. My X variables are the first three that you see, and then um, those variables crossed as well. And um, I'll go through uh, the bolded rows. I'll, I'll go through one example of what this is, and then um, I'll go through the what it means conceptually. So if you just look in the first row, the variables total coastal distance, the estimate column shows you uh, directionality. So if it's positive, if it's a positive relationship. And then the p-value shows if it's a significant relationship or not. So for the first one, for total coastal distance, we see that it has a positive relationship with FST values. This makes sense because the greater distance you are, the two habitats, the greater distance they are, they're more likely to be uh, genetically dis uh, differentiated. The bottom row is the other one that makes sense. And so when you have total distance of hard rocks um, and you interact it with the number of headlands, it also creates um, it seems to create a genetic barrier. What doesn't make sense is the two rows in the middle that are bolded. And so number of headlands has a negative relationship with FST, but that doesn't make sense because a headland should be a barrier. It shouldn't be promoting genetic similarity. And then same thing with when you cross total coastal distance with um, hard rocks. So I need to revisit the landscape variables I'm using and how I'm crossing them because it doesn't seem to be fully providing a clear story. And so this also includes expanding the analyses to include um, Central Coast Unit and other management units as well. So time doesn't seem to be affecting the population genetic structures within management units. Uh, the designations for the semi-use and conception um, unit may need to be revisited. And then further analysis needs to be done to try and see if any landscape variables can explain the genetic breaks that we're seeing. Um, so <laughs> by now I've touched on most of these elements, uh, again, besides culture. And the last one I have left is education. And so this next chapter is near and dear to my heart because this is what makes my dissertation interdisciplinary and I'm all for interdisciplinary research and education. Um, and education is really important for conservation bio, um, not only for conservation bio, but can be applied across um, multiple disciplines as well. Um, and in this case, it's important, <laughs> sorry, my phone. Um, it's important to uh, investigate how we can improve um, how we teach conservation biology. So this is the title of my third chapter. Students use drawing as a study tool less frequently yet it suggests positive effects on undergraduate midterm scores in restoration ecology. So visualizations are super important because they're everywhere. Um, it applies to all education levels and research. And uh, for example, visuals can aid in learning terminology and concepts and making connections, such as learning uh, about terrestrial invertebrates or making concept maps. And visuals are also integral to research in designing experiments and visualizing and interpreting data. And so these are the different types um, uh, that a visualization can be, or at least some of them. And so we see that static illustrations, for example, are what we're, what we're used to seeing in textbooks. It can help uh, teach terminology. Animations can be used to uh, provide simulations and modeling in mathematics and physics classes. And then we have drawings where you can draw concepts and make connections between multiple concepts. So I'm focusing on drawings compared to the other visualizations, which tend to be pre-generated. Drawings are learner generated. And so that allows students to produce and discover their own interpretations of the course material. 
Um, and so this can support students to engage with the course content in different ways and making connections with concepts um, on their own. So in general, most studies have focused on the effects of drawing activities on student learning in K through 12 classes um, and less in higher education. And there are also studies on interventions, a few studies on interventions that show um, them modifying undergraduate studying behavior. And so most relevant to this chapter is Nubraha 2018, which found a positive correlation between drawing quality and exam scores, but there was no control group. And then another one is by Heidemann and al, uh, which found an increase in students using drawing as a study tool. Uh, but the study was conducted in a non-classroom setting, plus they use different um, drawing activities than uh, we did in our study. So this leads to my other research questions is, what study tools do undergraduates use to study for an exam? What is the relation between drawing and academic performance on a midterm? And how does drawing affect academic performance on a midterm? So I had to conduct two separate studies to answer these questions. Uh, the first study was to identify student studying behavior, and it was done in spring 2020 in Restoration Ecology, taught by Laren, Laren Gorlitsky, and it was taught remotely online. And I led two separate in-class drawing activities. A second study uh, was to identify how drawing impacts academic performance. It was done in the exact same class, but in spring 2022. This was taught in person. And I also led uh, two very similar drawing activities. Uh, the difference here is that I randomly distributed uh, midterms to the students that either required them to draw or not draw uh, before providing a written response on their exam. And so all drawers were required to submit their drawing, but only their written responses were graded. Uh, so data collection included um, students giving responses to pre and post surveys uh, that included Likert scale and open-ended questions. And then I also used their midterm scores and the midterm responses uh, for data analysis. And I did remove two, um, two drawers uh, because they were outliers, which if you have questions about that uh, after, feel free to ask. And so this ended up um, only having 23 people in each uh, group. And again, these are the different data analytical approaches that I'll break down. So first, studying behavior. Students were asked to rank which study tools they used uh, more than others relative to one another on a six-point Likert scale, where six means a lot and one means not used at all. And the study tools included um, their notes, lecture slides, online resources, discussing with classmates, assigned readings, and in-class drawing activities. Now, this is a box plot that shows which of those study tools students uh, most likely use to study for the midterm or to learn course material uh, in previous biology classes compared to EE Bio 136, which is restoration ecology. And you can see that in both um, figures that students use their notes and lecture slides the most. And this was um, statistically significant. Um, and we can also see that they had similar studying behavior uh, regardless of the biology class that they were taking. Nothing too surprising. So next I plotted the midterm scores um, and group them based on discussion sections and also um, the treatment groups. And so on the left, we have the discussion sections. Um, there is no statistical significant difference between the two, which is a good thing, because that means the TAs are both grading very similarly. But then as soon as we uh, break them up, um, we can see that the red dotted line is the average, which is still pretty high. But we can see that the draw groups still perform significantly higher than the non drawers And so um, this is suggesting then that their drawing does have some sort of positive impact on midterm score. So that was the easier part of the story. So now this is the harder part, was to try to figure out why uh, drawers scored higher on the midterm than non-drawers. And what is it about drawing that helped them to score high? So after I um, scored the drawing qualities and based on a rubric adapted from that previous study, there was no correlation between uh, midterm scores and drawing quality. Um, I then did a sentiment analysis where you basically just try to find if there's any emotion in the responses. And, uh, and I did that across three different parameters and no statistical significance. And then last, there was also no uh, difference in the total number of words used between the groups. So what I did was I took those words 
and I ended up categorizing them into words that were rest more related to restoration ecology or more related to not restoration ecology. And so some of those examples include abiotic environment are more restoration ecology, and then more neutral words like ability, hope are not. And there was a difference between the two groups. But this still doesn't answer why or how drawing uh, helped the jars for significantly higher than non drawings. Like, what is it about drawing that helped them? So, next, uh, for the first midterm responses, I ran a correlation network analysis, which shows which paired words are more likely to appear with one another. The darker the shade means higher correlation, but note that the, each graph has their own scales. And so after filtering for words that had a correlation of 0.2 and higher, this is what you get. And you can see that in the non-drawer group, they kind of have this more simple, more linear connections. Whereas in the drawer group, there are some linearity, but there's, they make connections between at least four words, right? And so you get that crisscross, whereas you get these triangles in the non jars So it seems like um, drawers are kind of making these more complex uh, connections between words um, in their responses, which might be the reason why they're scoring higher compared to non drawers So students seem to be using their notes and the lecture sites more frequently than drawing activities to study for the midterm. Uh, drawing also appears to have a positive effect on academic performance. And this may be because drawers are making more connections uh, between paired words compared to non drawers and in turn, drawing also seems like it's a promising active learning tool that we can use in higher education uh, in general, uh, but also to teach conservation biology. So hopefully by now I have um, convinced you how it is important to uh, tackle all these different pillars on how it informs approaches to conservation biology. It includes um, traditional ecology and evolutionary biology research while having tangible applications and outcomes such as informing management decisions. And there are many other factors that we should study to understand how it impacts conservation, such as education that we often kind of forget. And there's also others that I didn't discuss today, such as culture and racism, but all of these are important. Um, the slide is very difficult for me. So I'm gonna read my notes and not look at anyone. Uh, this graduate program is immensely difficult. It's really difficult in many ways for the average person. For example, Some people have dropped out and have been pushed out of the program for reasons related and not related to the graduate program. And EB is no exception. For the PhD students who are sustained from being pushed out, there are some of us who still don't make it and don't end up completing their PhDs. which is why I want to dedicate the completion of my PhD to these two. Um, I think there are many things wrong with higher education, uh, especially the system. And even technically, um, I shouldn't be here. And I wanted to share with all of you that um, I was actually rejected by all of the grad programs I applied to, including UCLA. Um, and I probably only disclose that to like one or two people in the department. And the only reason why I'm here is because um, I was awarded the NSF GRFP, which is a prestigious national fellowship that turned a rejection from the EEB master's program into an acceptance into the PhD program. And even one reviewer for the fellowship wrote that they were confident that I was capable of addressing my own knowledge gaps as a researcher since I was transitioning careers into the sciences. But then why was there a discrepancy in the rejection letters in um, the actual graduate programs? So I feel like my rejections reflect at least three facts about the system. Um, one, 
that money is power and privilege and it can buy you a degree. Just look at all of the undergraduate scandals, right? Both at UCLA and USC. And this rate is also unknown for graduate and professional degree programs. This also extends um, to those who receive financial support from their family members or partners during their degree programs. It also shows that the admissions and review systems are updated since acceptances are based on the bias that shape belief that only good researchers are white. And there are many studies that support this bias, including one where men and women faculty had a bias for prospective applicants who are men, despite them having the exact same resume as women. And I was rejected by graduate programs, likely based on the belief that I didn't have the capacity to be a researcher, uh, to be a promising re researcher, but look at what I presented to all of you today. And the other thing is that um, an acceptance into a graduate program is not a reflection of one's ability to succeed in that system that was originally not built for them. Just look at all the people who got pushed out. And at the same time, uh, rejections are not a reflection of your ability to succeed either. So, for, uh, to succeed in a system that also wasn't built for you. Just look at me and the many others who were rejected, uh, but do actually have the capacity to be researchers. So I'm sharing this experience with all of you today uh, to give you a glimpse as to what experiences I've uh, been through and what so many people with similar identities also experience. Um, as Dave mentioned at the beginning, I am a first generation undergrad. Neither of my parents had the opportunity to complete a college degree. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity. I'm also um, the first in my family to pursue a graduate degree. Neither of my sisters have a graduate degree yet. Um, I'm also a child of immigrants and war refugees. Uh, now, these are two separate identities. My parents immigrated from Vietnam because they escaped the Vietnam War in 1975, which is known as the American War in Vietnam. Um, I'm also a queer Vietnamese American. And I'm here today uh, representing my culture and the milestone for my family, which is why I'm wearing this uh, Vietnamese traditional clothing. And because of my identities, I also want to dedicate my PhD to all of those with similar backgrounds who feel like they failed when in fact it was the system that failed them. So thank you um, everyone. Thank you the Jacobs Lab for all of the mentorship um, and emotional support throughout this entire PhD. Special shout out goes to a uh, person in the bottom left, Elizabeth Heath Heckman, who uh, was a former postdoc now faculty at MSU. Um, she was really pivotal in training me um, early in my PhD career. Uh, I also want to thank Tall, which is my other lab, um, for accepting me into their lab and also making me um, laugh a lot every time we had lab meetings. And of course, my undergrad mentees. And I want to thank my committee members um, for all their support, especially in this uh, final couple of quarters, and then everyone listed here. And of course, I want to thank uh, my partner and my family, and my beautiful family who's continuing to grow. Nisa's is on the way. Um, um, but yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. We don't have to do questions. Okay. <laughs> Optional. <laughs> Gina. What <laughs> um, um, Six. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I allow to say one next engagement. Of course. Um, I recommend because you're old now. Um graduate students ask the first questions and they're done. Then that does that work? Yes, that totally works. And I'm totally open, uh, fine with opening up to like um friends and family as well. And any undergrads who are here. And parents. And parents, yes. Any questions? Mary. Thank you, Ben. This was a great talk. Thanks for having me on this hard and, and for you know, writing how long it took you to do all those great things. <laughs> um, but that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, and I, I love drawing steady. 
I believe I was there. But <laughs> can you tell us more about what they actually drew or like the yeah, so the drawing activities that we did, um, at least for restoration ecology, one concept was related to succession, and then the other was related to assembly order. Those are the two main concepts. Um, but basically what I did was I gave them a prompt, or actually before then, I even gave them recommendations on how to like draw. So like, if any of them were scared of drawing, they could actually use like squares to represent a bird or something and like draw arrows. So they didn't really have to physically draw. Um, but then afterwards, I gave them a prompt of that I put together, and then they tried to draw it on their own. And then I gave them like about 10 minutes to do that on their own. And then we did like a think pair share with a, someone else right next to them. Um, and then we had a big class discussion about it. And so I was linking their drawing back to the concepts that we had learned in lecture or that they had learned in the previous lecture. Oh, I guess. Um, so you said you're still working on that chapter with like the like stuff in the area. Was a little bit, and I, I feel like there was kelp cover there somewhere. Were you looking at that because of the chapter? Yeah. So there was kelp at the variable, um, and the reason for that is because there is kelp along the coastlines, potentially between neighboring habitats or something. And so I did include it, or at least average kelp um, area into the GLM. And uh, uh, it didn't show to have any sig statistical significant um, relationship with FST. Um, but honestly, that could be something like on my end where maybe I went a little too far out in terms of looking at it on a satellite image, which might have like overestimated the number of amount of kelp. But right now it says nothing is happening. But it could also be a technical issue. Yes, Kaya. Um, so I'm interested in your recommendation for redefining relationship units. I know a lot about um, how those are initially defined and how the policy intersects with science in that way. Um, I'm curious what you see as the future of uh, that, that type of sort of practical definition of conservation units and how it would interface with like ongoing changes in genetic structure and like the complexity of that tool which is necessarily important. yeah yeah that's a good question so i think um the question about management units and how they're currently designated i think for the first chapter it's a little more obvious because <laughs> it's at least like one site that potentially got extirpated um i think it gets a lot more complex with the conception unit as you saw there's not really anything consistent um yeah, I, I have no idea what would happen from now on, like if we were to even report it to US Fish and Wildlife and show that there's kind of overlap uh, between their current subunits. Um, yeah, I think part of the challenging thing in that question is that things are changing so often and there's so much movement. Um, and this might just be a way to either sure redefine some of those units but maybe even like expand them to include like another site or something but in terms of like the details of that i, I have no idea Joey. um really interesting comment thank you. thank you um i was hoping that you could speak a little bit about the sort of gene pool analysis that you did with the arrows showing uh, movement between um like within populations um, between the years and i was wondering if you could extrapolate a little bit and um, I'm curious to see uh, what your prediction would be for the future. So, um, this one about climate change. Yeah, exactly. Thinking about climate change futures, um, do you, would you expect that within population flow decrease or um, change? Or... Yeah, um, I think that's a good question too. Um, I guess the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> the but the first thought that I had is. Um, I guess with climate change, it could be likely that these lagoons are breached more just because there might be more rainfall. That might be an option. Another direction it could take is that just these lagoons kind of disappear if you kind of go into a different extreme um, altogether. And then if that happens, then I personally don't know where <laughs> the fish would go. Um, there may be a pattern in how 
they tend to migrate directionally, like maybe they just migrate more south for a reason that I don't know. Um, but that is something to consider. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so I was curious about the words. Um, in what it didn't seem like there was any overlap were uh, in conception uh, unit. No, the word words. Um, I'm going back to your. Oh, the drawing, the drawing chapter. chapter. Yeah, and so it seemed like there was no overlap between the words in drawing case and non drawing case. Mm -hmm. Is that true, or is that, or is that, is that is it say set up that way, or is that as a uh, um, no, there's there's some overlap. There's even some cases where the words might even be able to be combined. Like in the drawer side, in the very left, you see increased in past tense and increase in present tense. Uh, but there is overlap in terms of um, like I think I looked this up. Yeah, you know. yeah, like nutrient would be one. Whereas on the left, very left for non drawers, they kind of make this triangular. Uh, more likely to make this triangular connection. Whereas at least in that case, in that specific example for jars, they're more likely to connect nutrients to the word excess. Yeah, so did you, did you, did you compare, you know, homologous topologies? No, I did not, but that's a, that's a good idea to see where words overlap, at least um, with the first midterm question. Yeah, Morgan. Thank you, Ben. Um, really great presentation. It's like really wonderful. Thank you. I, in this chapter as well, I think I caught that you assess the drawing ability of the drawers. You, did I get that? Um, so for, in terms of grades, drawing didn't matter. It was only written response. In terms of drawing, it wasn't drawing ability, it's more like drawing quality. But so I, I have a follow-up, but what, is so that, what's your question? the quality of the drawers? I did. And how did you do that? That's Okay, so I, in a previous study, what that did that they had like a rubric that showed like maybe you get this score because you made zero absolutely zero connections and you maybe get a score of seven because you made two connections as opposed to one. And so that was kind of a rubric that I had adapted based on that study and then I went back and blindly scored uh, the drawings, but the that I feel like that result should still taken be taken a little lightly because in the in that previous study they allocated like 15 minutes total for drawing, whereas mine it was just like draw before writing. And I couldn't monitor it mainly because it was also a take home midterm. So you can't really monitor how these students are doing things before writing. But yeah, that's how I did it. But I would still, it's a little, <laughs> uh, could vary with um, the previous study. Yeah, Joanna. Great Thank you. Of the world's happening. That's Paul. Do things that we can change about the curriculum or it, the system. I guess relevant to what I presented, we should probably revisit how we think about admissions. Um, it might be that the rubrics we have now are like equitable, but there's definitely a lot of things that we could work on. Um, so that's probably one thing is admissions. And um, I don't know, two, top two. <laughs> I have no idea. My mind is kind of going in like all over the place. Uh, Part of me wants to say like maybe the financial aspect of it, that's kind of hard to track. Like it would be nice if we were somehow able to track students who did not or, or had very little financial support, if any, from other family members and then kind of give them more money or more support or resources in any certain way. But I also know that that's kind of really challenging because it's also asking a lot more from the applicant and kind of like disclosing a lot of personal uh, personal challenges we might be experiencing. Big question, <laughs> Evan. Um, I do have a question um, for going to the Gobi's. Uh, you're saying that with the bulb region, so is there more like a seasonal impact in that migration where like, you might be truncated to a university model? 
especially this year with a lot of water coming through, or is this something that happens throughout the year? Oh, wait, so what was your question? So, so when the, the Gobies are seeing this migration, yeah. Um, I don't know if we get, I'm, um, I'm already running out of my river money. <laughs> uh, are you seeing maybe seasonal trends, or I don't know if your data will be able to capture that? Either, like if you're seeing this flushing of fresh water into these estuary systems, um, is that where you see that most of this migration probably occurring, or is this something that happens throughout the year? Um, it's definitely aligned with the rainfall amount in any given year. So I think like if we have really dry years, right, we wouldn't expect migration to occur. Um, I think in order to try and detect that, it would just require us going into the field completely after a rainfall event. Um, and in the case that I showed you, it just so happened, which I actually don't know if they did that intentionally, <laughs> to do field work in um, February of 2008, right after a rainfall event in January. Um, but yeah, I, I would think it's related, um, but probably closer look would probably require like sampling right after those rainfall events. And did you have a question? I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. I was really nice stepping into it. Thank you. <laughs> this is my sister. <laughs> 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 Do you think there's a correlation between how the benefits of drawing lines to the test scores for students who are earlier in the college education versus those that are in more advanced? So, do you think it's helpful in both cases or one being more beneficial than the other? Yeah, that's a totally fair question to ask. Um, so, something that I actually didn't measure <laughs> is what we call prior knowledge. And so, we can kind of get to that idea of maybe students who are freshmen, which this is a technically a higher an upper division class. So maybe the variation might be between like juniors and seniors. But you could have maybe juniors that have um, a lower maybe prior knowledge compared to seniors who presumably have higher prior knowledge. So yeah, so I, I didn't measure that, but you're absolutely right. There could be um, potential differences based on prior knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kyle. Um, really beautiful talk, Matt. Um, Thank you. Is there a lot of variability or is there a lot of variability in genetic diversity among those lagoons? And does that have any impact on the population? If there's a lot of genetic diversity in the lagoons. Like variability across or very, some lagoons more diverse than others. And, and is that, is that um I guess what I'm thinking of is you almost kind of have to read or like be specific in how you define lagoon because it could be a lagoon that's maybe on the borderline between two management units. And so in that case, those lagoons could be or the populations could be genetically different. I think if we think of lagoons within uh, the same subunits, presumably they should. Migration is more likely to occur within subunits, or at least that's what we think is happening. So I think if we think of it in that way, there should, in theory, be not as much uh, genetic diversity within that subunit. Yeah. In terms of fitness, though, I, I don't know how that would impact it. Is. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, totally. So yes, there were two outliers in the drawer group. Um, one undergrad didn't even complete their midterm. I'm not sure why. And so I kind of had to, they only answered one out of the two questions. And so I had to remove them or remove that person. And then the second person, um, if you actually graph them in their discussion section and even within the groups, they like completely failed in both groups. And so what that tells me is that in the discussion section, because it's like the only person who like absolutely bombed it, um, even though the TA sections kind of had similar approaches to grading, because like the grades were fairly close to each other, that even that one student, it's like, it didn't make sense. So it kind of like uh, booted that person out too. <laughs> Brendan. 
Uh, can you start the second chapter? You mentioned there was a very particular relationship between sort of in reverse order. A little confused as to why that would be the case. I think it seemed to be significant, but sort of pointing the wrong way. Um, I think one was like in this one. Of, uh, no. Um, it was, uh, was it the one with the arrows? Yeah. 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 For, for say like number of headlines, like is that is there a, a mathematical model of satellite data that is measuring that or is that more that looks like a headline that looks like a headline? Whereas like total coastal distance, that's obviously like a dimensional model. Yeah, some of the others seem to have for how's that one? Yeah. Uh, are there any issues that other items could act as headlines that are for. Yeah, that's a totally fair question. So I think in this case, there's kind of like obvious um, answers where this one could be a headline by itself. This is a headline, this one, this one. I think if we zoom in, which I don't have right now, but there's like this little nook right here. Um, I don't know if I would have classified that as a headline right now. It looks like it could be. Um, but the parameter I was using is mostly just like estimated size or like width of that headland on um, satellite image. Uh, but yeah, that's a totally fair question because there could be a threshold either most, I guess, more important is before then, like what you would define becoming a headline and then to actually count it. But yeah, there wasn't there wasn't like a true parameter that I had used other than estimating on average, like I think it was like 300 meters. If it was 300 meters in width, then I counted it as a headline. And that was just based on observation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but going in the past, um, like sea level rising, but it going back, we can see little areas of fear. I think there might have been a or something similar. So it sounds like they've been present, but since the sea level has risen, that geography, that underlying topography and geology is really Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we prefer to take readers. Oh, yes. <laughs> there is a paper by Greer et al. <laughs> um, uh, it's been a while since I read that paper, though. Uh, but <laughs> you can go read it. <laughs> Please, no questions about geological maps. Um, yeah, that's all. I know, I know we're over time. Thank you, everyone.